section, I just want to unpick more about play um, in terms of the definition of play and how it links to Forest School. We've already covered um, various threads of this conversation and we've perhaps already unpicked some of the, the bigger issues. But the other day, it was yesterday or the day before, I asked you to um, think in your mind of your own play memories, a, a, a memory that was from your own childhood. And my question now is, well, how did you know that that was play? What, what was about it that was, that was, you know, that you knew that that was play as opposed to something else that you were doing? Go, go for it. I heard self-directed. Self-directed. Something over here. Okay, just no adults. Yeah. No. Okay, it was outside. It was imaginative. Imaginative. Having fun. Okay, not outcome driven. So it was that few limitations. You limitations. Is that free? Yeah, yeah free. Free. Like creative. creative. No concept of time. No concept of time. No concept of time. No rules. No rules. So you can make up the rules. So make up the rules, make up the rules, make up the rules. Okay. 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 I'm just going to put this to one side. We're going to come back to it, okay? Because we're kind of forming our own definition as to what we understand as play. But play, I think, within our culture is... A little bit misunderstood. Oh, hang on, hang on, go back a bit, go back a bit. <laughs> it's a bit misunderstood. Um, and sometimes I've heard the word play being used almost in a derogatory kind of way, you know, like, oh, they're just playing as if play wasn't important. Or, you know, do your work first and then go play as if work and play were two different things or had to be two different things. The idea of play time, like you can just like switch on when you play and when you don't play in terms of, you know, it's framed by time. But, you know, humans are not the only creatures to play. In fact, pretty much all mammals, some birds, even some reptiles have been observed at play. So it's, it's something that isn't unique to the human species. It's something that has obviously evolved um, through millennia and if you believe in Darwin then it obviously has an evolutionary necessity because anything that isn't useful gets kind of lost along the way doesn't it and yet <laughs> monkeys playing snowball fights <laughs> is is happening so play is obviously really important not just to humans but to all sorts of species it must be evolutionary necessary to um to us and to other species and yet you know we kind of brush it off sometimes or consider it you know a childish a childish pastime kind of thing i've even heard some like early years practitioners say that they're not allowed to use the word play at their setting because if the children go home and tell the parents that they've been playing all day that the parents get you know upset and they instead they have to say we've been directing our own learning today it's like, wow, it's almost like play's a dirty word. Um, I would also suggest in our culture that the word play gets misused in terms of some things get called play that isn't in terms of the definition that we're going to be talking about. I'm not saying that those things aren't 
enjoyable or um, uh, you know have value, but it's just something different. So, for example, we say we play computer games or we play sport. I would say that neither of those things are play in the terms that we're going to be talking about, although you know they're highly recreational um, and and enjoyable, um, but they're not true play in in this sense. So. We've started creating a definition. What do other people say? So here's a few quotes from some historic figures. So Montessori was like, well, play is work for children. You know, it's the work of the child. Albert Einstein, he was a smart dude. I reckon he was like a proper player. Like, he is like <sighs> the apex of play. He's a really good example of play. It's the highest form of research, says Albert. Carl Jung, you know, psychoanalysts. <laughs> the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct. You know, academic people saying, you know, it's not, it's not intellect, it's, it's playing that's important. And good old Frederick Froebel, grandfather of the kindergarten movement, you know, a good couple of hundred years ago. It's the highest expression of human development in childhood, for it alone is the free expression of what is in the child's soul. Can't get much more important than that, can you? An expression of one's soul, the apex of humanity. But, you know, just playing, just playing. Do your work first. So um, it's been valued throughout history by different people. Um, uh, it's worth knowing, if you don't already, that the right to play is written into the UN Convention uh, in terms of the rights of the child. So it's in there. So this is kind of like the equivalent of the human rights document for children. Um, you know, so in there's things like children have the rights to um, you know, drinking water and food and shelter and medical care and education, and play is in there as well. So it's in there as a human right. In this document, a child is referred to up to the age of 18 as well. So it's not just like little children. We're talking, you know, 17-year-olds needing to have the right to play. And in that document, they had to kind of define, I suppose, what they meant by that. And so um, the recognised definition of play is this, a behaviour which is freely chosen, personally directed and intrinsically motivated. So it has to have those three things. So let's just have a look at our definition over here. And perhaps we should see um, that we've kind of echoed that. So freely chosen, as in, um, I guess, perhaps, you know, we're free. We're free to choose what we're wanting to do. We're not necessarily being told what to do. It's not, it's, we're not being bribed to do something. You know, it's not like, play nicely, I'll buy you a bag of sweets kind of thing. Um, we're, we're choosing to do that behaviour. Then personally directed, or you know, we've got self-directed, or we make up the rules. Yeah, we have control over what we're doing. We can steer things, we can change things, we can make things up. Then intrinsically motivated. I suggest that our definition here in terms of having fun and no concept of time links to things being intrinsically motivated. So what I mean by that, as in the drive to play, the drive to do whatever you're doing is coming from inside yourself. You're getting a sense of satisfaction from doing that thing that you're doing. You're not being told what to do. You're not doing it for the for the pleasure of others. You're not doing it to meet others' expectations. You're not doing it out of a sense of duty. You're not doing it because you think other people will like you if you do that. It's coming from you, it's intrinsic to you. Hence why I guess it's the expression of a person's soul because it's intrinsically motivated. So, so let's look at this definition a bit more, right? Take, I'm going back to Albert Einstein, right? By this definition, not all play is, uh, I don't mean this derogatory, but you know, not all play is like childish play. It's, it's not like necessarily how you would picture perhaps young children playing. It, it is, of course, for, for those, but it's not always like that. And I'm not saying that that's not valuable. It is valuable. Let's take Albert when he was coming up with the groundbreaking physics of E equals MC square. Okay, let's have hold that up against this definition. Freely chosen, well, 
Nobody told Albert to go and think up of the, the theory of the general theory of relativity. No one said, can you do this, please, Albert? <laughs> he did it because that's what he did. That's what he loved to do. He chose to do it. Personally directed. Well, yeah, because he was breaking science as it was kind of known. I'm sure he kind of drew inspiration and kind of um, some knowledge from other scientists and other work and stuff. But he was, you know, doing stuff that no other scientists had done. He was like imagining riding a beam of light and, you know, how time is affected. But I don't even, I don't understand E equals MC squared. I held my hands up. I'm not a physicist. But it's pretty revolutionary. It's changed the course of science. And then intrinsically motivated. Well, yeah, right? At the beginning, he wasn't working as a scientist. He wasn't getting paid for it. He was working as a clerk in a patent office at the time that he did his best like early science. And apparently it took four years for any other scientist to kind of take notice and understand just how significant this, this piece of science was. So at the beginning, there was four years he wasn't famous, his name wasn't out there. He didn't get any of those external rewards. He was intrinsically motivated to do it because that's what he loved to do. And he changed the course of human history and how we perceive the world. He was playing. That's how he was doing it. He was playing. Could you imagine if someone said to Albert, stop doing that, go and do your filing? <laughs> we would be in a very different world now in terms of our understanding of science. So play is the highest form of human expression. It is. It's so... I think we're living in a, in a world of play deprivation as well, in terms of this. There's not much of this going around. Often when I say this, um, sometimes to parents, they go, oh yeah, my kid's playing all the time, they're always on the computer playing. Okay, so let's hold that up against this definition, okay? Playing a computer game. Freely chosen, okay, yeah, I'll give you that one. You might choose to play a computer game. Often people do, they're very addictive, they want to play the computer game. Personally directed, well, okay, some games have more options and more choices within them, things like Minecraft and things where you can kind of create stuff that is more choice, but ultimately you can't do anything beyond the, what the program is able to do, unless you're a hacker, right? I'd say computer hacking is play, but not playing computer games, yeah, because computer hacking you're personally directing, yeah, you're making up stuff. Intrinsically motivated, no way. Computer games are full of external rewards. Loads of them, like bing, 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 bing. You've reached top score. Oh, you've unlocked this secret treasure. You've got a chance of getting this new piece of armor or bing, 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 bong. It all goes wee, woo, wee, yeah? They're all externally hooked things to keep you playing, you know, as rewards, external flashy rewards, so that you want to keep kind of spinning the wheel or doing whatever it is that you're doing to keep playing. They're full of external rewards. They're not intrinsically motivated. So by this definition, playing computer games is not play. It's not play. So, um, yeah, so we kind of need to rethink of how, how, how we consider play. So let's unpick this a little bit more in, uh, in terms of looking at it in terms of forest school. So yesterday when we were exploring like the routine, which I popped up on the wall over there, I was telling you like all the stuff that we do, the adult directed stuff that we do is just a means to an end to reach a state of play. So I'm talking about this in terms of something that's freely chosen, personally directed and intrinsically motivated. So Forest School tries to meet all three of these criteria. Again, we might not be able to do it right at the beginning of a program because of people not knowing how to play and that it could cause anxiety. People need to feel safe and secure and be guided into it. We need to be a bridge to play. But we want to be aiming to get there. So firstly, you know, it's freely chosen. So it is that balancing between the structure and the freedom. 
Of course, we're in nature. There's loads of stuff going on all of the time. So curiosity is being sparked all of the time to kind of draw people in, to choose to do things. We really get to know our learners. We observe them very carefully. And that gives us ideas of perhaps if we're still in structure mode, observing the learners will give us clues as to what might work with them. Like, you may have noticed I haven't sung a song today. <laughs> <laughs> I twigged that maybe you're a group that don't like singing. I played a game today, though, because I twigged yesterday you might like playing games. So we adapt, we choose different things based on the groups that we're working with. Offering choices like we did on the immersion day, where we had, you know, we brought out some kits and we showed you suggested things you could make or do with those things, the ropes, the craft materials. They're there, but you don't have to. You could freely choose between those um, we plan for next steps based on what we've observed and we've talked about being flexible. We plan, yet we might be ditching that plan to go in the moment and be flexible. And our risk management systems enable us to do that. Personally directed, well, we've got loads of natural stuff out there in the woods that are what play people would call loose parts. Loads of loose parts. Um, as in non-prescriptive resources that could be used for all sorts of things. Um, yesterday, was it yesterday or the day before? You got your stick, but it wasn't a stick. It was a magic wand. It was a navigation device. It was a unicorn or whatever it was. You know, it could be whatever. And of course, we see that very naturally in young children. You know, that, that the log becomes a horse to ride or a crocodile to avoid or whatever. That happens naturally. And um, because we're in nature, we get real life feedback on how we're interacting with things. So um, as an example, it's raining, yeah? So we're getting wet. <laughs> That's the natural consequence of rain. So, you know, if we don't like getting wet, we maybe could do something about it. Perhaps we could rig a shelter if we want to. I've got some tarps, I've got some ropes. Uh, you know, we rig the shelter. We see that the water is pooling in a particular part of the tarp. So that gives us the ability to kind of change what we're doing, change how we're tying it together. We're getting immediate feedback from the environment. It's not like doing stuff in theory where you have to wait for your work to be marked to know whether, you know, you're on the right track or not. Nature gives you all the feedback and all the lessons that we kind of need. Uh, and so that, that means things can evolve and progress and get really quiet really quite high end because of that you know something i've noticed in schools with young children um is people can often underestimate young children but actually they're capable of really quite high order stuff if given the opportunity and given the right environment and you know some of the stuff you know once you get going for a school months and months in like when i was teaching because I taught reception in Key Stage 1, the younger ones. So my class had been coming out for me for at least a couple of terms before the Key Stage 2 kids were allowed to come out. And um, my five-year-olds were doing things that the Year 6s, the 10, 11-year-olds couldn't do yet. Because, they, you know, so it's not... So age, I think, is not always an indicator of a person's capabilities, but it's the experiences that they have and the opportunities that are presented uh, to them. Um, another thing about personally directed is the forest school is a flat hierarchy. There is no hierarchy. It's a flat kind of community. There is, um, there's not such a great distinction between the adults and the children, if you're working with children. Like, we're on equal terms. So, you know, in the classroom, I might be Miss Ambrose, um, you know, and there I call them by their first names. But at forest school, I'm Lou Ladybird, just like there, Jessica... <laughs> Jabberwocky or whatever, yeah? We're on in much equal terms. The balance of power is more equal. Um, because it has to be. If you're going to build someone's self-esteem, emotional development and build trusting relationships, you can't have someone lording it up there and somebody else under their influence, under their power, in order to you know, improve emotional development. It has to be balanced. Um, that also might mean that as... Uh, leaders as assistants we actually share uh, information or um, like in terms of emotional literacy we might share things about our own lives with the, the children appropriately and usually for a purpose um, but again it's uh, it's worth checking in with yourself as to where you sit with that and 
is that it's being open and honest fundamentally, um, which is important if you're going to help people and build relationships. So then finally, you've got intrinsically motivated. Now, here's the biggie where um, it's not so common um, in general society. It kind of links to what we were talking earlier about sanctions and rewards, yeah? You can't intrinsically motivate whilst being within a sanctions and rewards environment because it, it, they are sort of the two different things, yeah? Sanctions and rewards are all about manipulation. They're about externally controlling someone, either through punishment or through bribery. The carrot or the stick. They're both two sides of the same coin. So at Forest School, we tend to avoid that. We talked about being non-judgmental, yeah? You had that as part of your group agreement, yeah? Being non-judgmental. Just to highlight this, non-judgmental means no, uh, not praising, just as you wouldn't criticise. Non-judgmental means non-judgmental, including positive judgments. We don't positively judge, just as we wouldn't negatively judge, because they're both damaging. I know this sounds a bit weird, because, and particularly if you come from a teaching background, we're told to praise. Particularly if you work with naughty learners, find something that they've done right and praise and praise and praise and praise. Yeah, that's you, what, what, praise them to build their self-esteem. Yeah, that's what we're told. That's not true. Um, in fact, praise can be really um, upsetting to people with low self-esteem. It could even, in worst case scenarios, trigger challenging behaviour. Um, we're going to look at self-esteem next module in more depth, but fundamentally people carry a self-image about how they feel about themselves. Um, so if you're told that you're bad, you're naughty, you're rubbish at this, you're rubbish at that, you know, you, know, you can't do this, and then somebody contradicts that in terms of going, wow, that's brilliant, did you do that? then it's like it doesn't compute. I can't, I can't handle that because that's not my comfort zone. I'm rubbish, I'm naughty, I'm bad. So if I do something like, an example, I work with a lad, it's one of the guys from the children's home, Andrew. Um, he spent months building this beautiful bug home thing. Months and months, you know, he'd split the woods, he'd, you know, it was beautiful, it was beautiful. We didn't say it was beautiful to him, but in my mind I was thinking it was beautiful. One day, somebody who wouldn't normally come to forest school came to forest school because there was some staff illness and they were coming to cover. They didn't understand the process. They saw this bug box that Andrew had made and was like, wow, Andrew, you made that. That's like, amazing. Wow. Andrew took the bug box, smashed it to pieces, threw an axe through the woods, completely you know, stomped off. We had, you know, situations there because Andrew isn't wonderful. He doesn't do brilliant things in his mind, in his self-image. Andrew's rubbish, he's been rejected, nobody wants him, he's stupid. So to come in and challenge that self-image through praise kind of caused challenging behaviour in that scenario, quite, quite dramatic challenging behaviour. So um, in terms of play, play is like the remedy to the sanctions and rewards-based system that we find ourselves, the, the judgmental rewards-based society. It's because it's through play that we find out what motivates ourself rather than doing something for somebody else. Um, Sorry, can you, can you, if you have a child who does something and comes up to you to say what do you think of this, mm -hmm. can you change your wording so that you're not, you're not directing the praise at them, but you are appreciating what they've done? So these are really interesting colours you've chosen, or oh, I can see how hard that must have been to get to the to make this or something like that. So you're acknowledging what they've done, but you've taken the you bit out of it. So does that make sense? It's yeah, so there are other strategies, there are other methods of talking. So, because um, I suspect we all perhaps are familiar with learners that are praise addicts. You know, they've been raised on praise. Look at mine, look at mine, look at me, look at me, look at me, look, is mine the best, is mine the best? What do you think, what do you think? Which, when I see that in learners, for me, that's a big red, red flag because it's like, okay, like what's, what should be important is the learning process of the individual and that they're doing things because they want to do them. If they're constantly obsessed with showing you their work or wanting you to, to see what they're doing, 
then to me that suggests they've got low self-esteem because they're wanting reinforcement from the outside world that what they're doing is right. Um, so you have to sometimes go quite gentle with this because you can't always go cold turkey because it can really throw them. Um, but there are other strategies. So, for example, gratitude is a strategy. You can be grateful, um, you know, if they've made you something. Well, thank you. You know, you, you can talk about that. You can make um, you can make observations fundamentally, like neutral observations. So, I've seen you make two loops in the rope to tie a clove hitch. And I've seen you kind of loop that over the post. And I saw you measuring the post with that post and kind of looping them together. And I saw you've made a fence. Um, you know, and often that can be more meaningful than just, oh, you've tied a clove hitch, well done. Because what you're actually doing is you're inviting more conversation. By saying, I've noticed this, this, and this, often the learners will chip back in going, going yeah, yeah, I was doing that version of clove hitch because I couldn't remember the other one, or, um, you know, I struggled to find a stick long enough. Is it, it's showing the curious side, that, that you're curious as to, you know, why mm. they've done that. So in a way you're saying, yes, you've, you've seen them, you've noticed what they've done, and you can appreciate, especially if it was hard for them to do, mm. but without... The, wow, great job, the, that really generic phase, you feel brilliant, mm. you've done a great job. And... You, you can also ask questions as well, so perhaps rather than saying, oh, that, you know, that must have been really hard, you could have asked, how, how did that feel, right. couldn't you, as well, so that it comes from them. Because in terms of working with people's emotions, you, sh that you should be kind of a bit mindful of putting words in people's mouths yeah. in case you mislabel their emotion. So sometimes when it's to do with like how people are feeling, um, it's perhaps more useful to ask questions. If you're working with learners who don't have a vocabulary to speak about their emotions, then ask them about their body sensations, the physiology. All emotional states have a physiology in the body. So you can ask, like, how did that feel? You know, in your body, you know, show me where you felt that. You know, if they're feeling pride, you know, pride is, you know, usually big puffed up chest, you know, you can see. Where the link, like, being a little, a little bit personal with, with the thrive that I do, that is often very much, we go through a stage of, I'm wondering, oh, I can see that you curled up into a ball, um, and that, you know, there are tears coming down, I'm wondering if such and such had upset you, I noticed that you're doing this, very much validating what they're going through, mm -hmm. but trying to link it in without, yes, then on the praising side, or if something's not gone quite right, and there's frustration there, trying to link it in with the same sort of um, what Pro School is saying, very much about the emotions, trying to sort of um, notice things and wonder and be curious mm. without being the, you know. Mm. Yeah, so curiosity is a really useful skill to be genuinely curious about what they've been up to. Um, there, are other, there are other perhaps more structured patterns of using language that are non-judgmental, which um, if you're interested in this is um, non-violent communication or NVC, which has been developed by a guy called Marshall Rosenberg. Um, and Marshall, when he developed this was he said that any form of judgment was an act of violence hence why it's called non-violent communication um, and there are like four stages to it so the first stage is make a concrete observation that's not judgmental the second stage is to um, identify the feelings that you're feeling in your body and then the third is what are the needs that are driving those feelings? And then the fourth is to make a request. Now, I've used this with success, <laughs> touch wood, um, in more heated moments. Um, so, for, so, for example, concrete observation. Joe, you're waving a knife. Two, <laughs> I feel scared. Three, because I have a need for my safety and your safety. Four, could you resheath the knife and put it on the block? All that dialogue, I'm not making a judgment. I'm not saying he's bad or naughty or that's not how we use knives, put it away, yeah? But it's all non-judgmental. 
Um, but I've had success with that if you're working with more vulnerable people in particular. Um, but yeah. At nursery, we sort of like we tried that for a little while, didn't we? We found I find it really hard to sort of like you know when a child's done something and you want oh that's brilliant, well done, brilliant. I found it really hard to not do it. Mm. It's like we, you know. Again, we live in a judgmental yeah. culture. Like everybody kind of praises all of the time, don't they? Yeah. You know, it's a part of like what we do. So um, to not do it is kind of swimming against the yeah. tide, as it were. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Which this might come across a bit harsh, but forgive me. But um, just take a moment to honestly reflect, okay? When you are praising people, are you praising it for their benefit or for yours? Just thinking about that. I know this is a bit harsh. It was a bit honest. I'm pretty sure we had honest on our group agreement. But, you know, I know in my own past, so I was raised in, in you know, a a fa mainstream family, you know, down in London, and, and people praise maybe because they want to be liked. I don't know. When I was a kid, you want, you know, want people to like you, you want to have friends. Oh yeah, I love, I love that. I love your hair. I, you know, you know, it's like almost conditioned into us, perhaps. But perhaps it's not always for the other person's benefit. Perhaps it's actually about us wanting to be socially accepted. Perhaps. Not all the time. Uh, but, you know, just offering it there as something to think about. Um, yes. Do you still use, um, since we use like, different tones, presumably you still use different, like if it's something dangerous, would you use a different tone of voice if you're doing? Oh, no, not really. Maybe. I suppose well, in the outdoor environment, often you might have to speak louder, obviously, for people to hear you. Um, I try to avoid, like, the teacher tone, if you know what I mean, <laughs> um, where possible. Um, uh, I suppose, like, when we do forest or sometimes, like, if someone's coming within a fire circle, we tend to use a very stern tone to explain that we don't you know, that is unsafe, whereas we wouldn't necessarily develop something less of a risk. Mm. You Sometimes, be... as well as when you're in that dramatic situation, it's actually better to lower your tone and be calmer because it kind of calms the situation as well, isn't it? Because also thinking about your praise, we've been doing this a lot in my setting, like I work with really young children, and if something happens between children, obviously try to get them to realise that they need to say sorry. But quite often the children just say sorry, and that's it, then they yeah, walk away. Yeah. But they actually, it's always now nice saying, now do you know what you've said sorry for? Because they've got to have that understanding as well. And that's a little bit saying, when you praise young children, they just listen to the well done, and they don't actually know mm. what they've done well, kind of thing. And so that point of just saying the word sorry, and not being sorry is coming back to intrinsically motivated. Well, are you apologising because you're intrinsically motivated to apologise in terms of do you, you understand that you've hurt that person or upset that person? Or are you saying sorry because some external force is telling you to? Yeah. And there's a big difference. Yeah. And then what's the point? There's no point in saying sorry if you don't know what you're saying sorry for. Yeah. Well, I was like, oh, sorry, I was going to say that. We say, we say to him, like, can you just go and see how that, like, that person's feeling. Can you see what if, you know what's happened there? Can you just go ask them how they are, or go like, you know, just ask them like questions. Yeah. I think it's easy to do it is compassion. Sometimes you find your tone comes out because of the reaction you're having yourself, which goes back to the phrase thing about it being to you. So you might brace against something that was challenging or dangerous, and then your tone changes, and you'll probably find that it's not coming from a compassionate place. It's coming from Mm. And the kids feel that. So and if they hear if they hear the lack of compassion and love in a negative order to stop doing something and they only hear the, the, the love and compassion in the good fluffy stuff, they start considering that those emotions are bad. 
And also those children are probably quite used to hearing that sort of tone at home all the time. It actually has no effect on them at all because whereas actually yeah. using a calmer voice, they're like, oh, what's this? This is new, kind of thing. Yeah, and mm. tone is so specific to the individual too. Mm. Mm. And of course, like, non-judgmental, being non-judgmental on yourself as well. As you say, we're so, like, mind washed to, to, to praise and stuff or to sanction and reward um, that you know don't beat yourself up about it if you if you do do it and also the children understand as well so like if you've had a, a bad moment and you've like lost it at a kid you know like talk to them about it afterwards apologize for it afterwards you know, they understand. Like, like in my class, one of the reception kids, Tyler, he, you know, he had a rough home life. It was, you know, difficult for him. He had various anger management problems. You know, it was a Friday afternoon, five minutes before home time. The carnage is across the classroom. We're trying to tidy up to get ready to go home. Something happens. Tyler's kicked off. The paint table's gone flying. And, you know, my voice raises. And I'm like, oh, sit down on the carpet. Da, 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 da. You know? Um, and, you know, afterwards, I did apologise to Tyler. I'm sorry for shouting at you. Because Tyler, out of all the, the kids, did not need shouting at. Because, you know, that's the only expression of anger and frustration he's ever seen, you know, at home. He doesn't need to see the expression of anger and frustration through shouting. I should have used a different um, method of expressing that. Um, so I apologised. And, you know, yeah, he's like, yeah, that's all right, miss. You know, I'm used to it. It's fine, <laughs> you know. So, um, and again, that comes back to being on a more level playing field, um, in terms of no hierarchy, in terms of the adults and the children. Um, just to signpost you to <coughs> um, some resources about this topic, Alfie Cohn is a particularly good source of this. He's an American guy um, that has written this book, Punished by Rewards, The Trouble with Gold Stars, Incentive Plans, A's, Praise and Other Bribes. Pretty hard, isn't it? There's also quite um, a few of his talks and speeches on, uh, on YouTube as well. He's a very, he's a very provocative and stimulating um, uh, speaker. He's also written a book focusing on parenting called Unconditional Parenting as well. Um, so for the parenting audience. So he talks about this. Um, to the extent of he's suggesting that things like rewards actually diminish the natural disposition for learning. So it's not just in terms of people's self-esteem and stuff, it actually stops people learning because um, people become more focused on the rewards than they do about the process. It's like they value the product more than the process that, of getting there. You know, I, I'm guilty of it myself. I remember at A-level, I did like maths, chemistry and biology at A-level. Ask me anything about chemistry now, I have no idea. I couldn't even do a titration. Couldn't even do that now. I remember cramming it for the exams. I never learnt it. I did it for the reward of getting a grade so I could go and do the course at university that I wanted to do. I didn't learn chemistry for the value of learning chemistry. I did it for the reward. So that's what he's kind of talking about in terms of it actually can impede the learning process. Um, a couple of other references while I'm waving books. Bob Hughes is particularly known uh, about in the UK in terms of play. He's kind of came up with the different play types and stuff. He's written several books, but this one's about evolutionary play work, as in looking at... Um, I guess the deep rootedness of play and the drive to play and how it's kind of an evolutionary important thing. Stuart Brown uh, has looked mainly perhaps at animals at play and le learning lessons from animals at play in terms of how that translates into humans. There's a very interesting story about polar bears and huskies in terms of... Um, in terms of story of a polar bear coming out... People who are uh, there have got huskies chained up. These people talk about seeing the bears and thinking, oh, God, we're walking home because the you know, chained up huskies can be an easy, tasty meal for a hungry polar bear. But apparently the dog kind of does, you know, the universal sign for play as dog to dip the front legs, yeah? The dog did that. And this bear then starts playing with the dog. 
So it's like rolling around and playing and, you know, the dog's on its back and, um, you know, having a good time. So in that case, the need to play outweighs the need to eat for that polar bear. Just thinking about how important that was. And apparently the bear came back like every day for like a fortnight and stuff to come play with the dogs. Like, so I think they were playmates. So even polar bears and huskies can play. And then finally, um, David Sobel, uh, it's an American guy, but he's written this, Childhood and Nature, Design Principles for Educators. So this is specifically looking at children at play in nature. And he's mapped what he calls these motifs which are natural tendencies of things that children will play when they're in nature. Things like tracks and trails or den making special places, like these themes emerge across cultures and across age ranges when you put children in nature. And he's suggesting that if educators know this, they're able to build more meaningful learning experiences for children by following the natural, intrinsically motivated aspects of children at play. David Sobel. So, that's what we mean when we say play at Forest School. And that's why Forest School takes a long time to uh, get there. And um, why good communication is important at Forest School. Because not everybody understands what we're trying to do. Um, but I believe that play is the source of people finding out their true selves and reaching their full potential. As Frederick Fogel said, it is the highest form of human expression. It's how we manifest the, our gifts to the world that we're all born with. It's through play and creativity. Mm -hmm.